For Creamer Media's Polity, I'm Sashni Madi. Joining me today is journalist Christopher Clark, here to unpack his book, Claire, The Killing of a Gentle Activist. Rural development worker Claire Stewart was one of the many anti-apartheid activists that received hardly any or no recognition. Can you briefly give us some insights into her life growing up in various parts of the world before settling in South Africa and starting her cattle cooperative? Sure. So Claire was born in 1959. She was born in Johannesburg, but the family, um, they had four children and, and they kind of lived all over the world, they, they had a, a long history of activism, I guess, in the family. And, and when the apartheid government came into power, their parents did not want to raise their children in South Africa um, in an apartheid country. So they had a bit of an itinerant life um, living in various different parts of Africa and Europe and the US. So Claire had lived by the time she was 18, 19, which is when she returned to South Africa, had lived kind of all over the world, but had always felt this very strong attachment to South Africa and wanted to come back and, and increasingly as she kind of yeah into her late teens and early 20s had this desire to be part of the change that was happening in that country. Her, her father was an English lecturer so it was often through different universities so very much in a kind of liberal arts setting but also through activists and, and predominantly kind of Catholic based um, activists, a very progressive, progressive Catholic circles and movements that kind of took them to a lot of these places or that they connected with in a lot of these places. Um, yeah, and then she, she eventually came back to the late 70s. She really wanted to be a part of that. Can you talk to us a bit about her politics? She was an ANC member and was also recruited into Nkwante Vesite. This was a time when sort of through the 70s um, as, and early 80s as Claire was kind of coming of age, obviously there was not only within South Africa and the ANC, but in Zimbabwe and Namibia and what was then Southwest Africa, there were a lot of continent-wide um, liberation movement. And obviously within South Africa, the ANC was at the forefront of that. And, and Claire, from again, from quite young, had, had wanted to be a part of that. And um, her sister at some stage was living in Zimbabwe. And whilst Claire was visiting, her sister was actually dating an MK commander at the time. This is what this particular commander told me in an interview with it was Claire was kind of constantly pestering him and, and saying, you know, I want to be a part of this. I want to be a part of this and give me something to do um, to the point where he kind of ultimately acquiesced to her demands and, and then introduced her to Ronnie Casarels, among others. And she was sort of yeah, brought into MK in a kind of reconnaissance position mainly where they were trying to figure out you know, places and ways in which she could keep a close eye on things that were happening. Um, and initially they looked at places like Limpopo um, and the Free State, but Claire did not speak very good Afrikaans. Um, she'd begun to learn quite good Zulu and was subsequently posted to KZN and so that felt like a natural fit because she did have a better grasp of the language and she was working, ended up working very close to the Mozambique border where there was obviously a lot of activity, ANC activists coming back and forth across the border, also weapons coming back and forth across the border and so on. Um, and at that time when Claire ended up there, that was kind of in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, there was also a lot of IFP, increasing IFP activity, military training camps and so on going on in the area. So there was a lot of stuff happening. And so she was kind of, yeah, taking photos at times and that kind of reconnaissance work, looking at routes that people could use, either were using or could use in and out of the country and, and just kind of keeping an ear and ear and eyes on, the, on what was going on on the ground through MK, yeah. Can you give us the timeline of her disappearance uh, on November 10th, 1993, to the discovery of her body two weeks later? Yeah. So Claire, she was running an, uh, a cattle project, an Nguni cattle project in Manguzi, which, as I said, is just a little bit south of the Mozambique border. And she was kind of setting off for work early in the morning, around seven-ish. She was going to go to her office, and then she actually had a meeting later that morning with some officials from the Department of Agriculture who were supposed to be branding the cattle that um, was in that were in this co-op. Um, that, that Claire had created, so it was quite a big day, effectively. Um, and Claire never arrived at this meeting. Um, she was abducted on her way to work. 
um, initially you know, there was some people thought maybe the car had broken down or they weren't really sure what had happened so they didn't think too much of it initially and then later in the afternoon people began to kind of worry and they went to the police station and tried to find out what was happening and eventually by the end of the day it had transpired that um, something was something had gone horribly awry because the, her vehicle was then found in Mpengeni being driven by somebody else and when the police pulled the car over, the car had actually been involved in a minor traffic accident in Mpengeni and so a police officer came to try and deal with the, the accident and this young guy that was driving Claire's car got spooked and ran away. One thing led to another and eventually they found out that okay, this, this car had been stolen, it belonged to this cooperative in Manguzi. Um, and so by the end of the day, people realized that Claire had gone missing, uh, that there was a magazine clip from an AK-47 found in the back of the car. So there was obviously kind of foul play of some kind had been involved at that point, but it took two weeks um, before her body was actually found. In the meantime, the family were obviously launching kind of media campaigns and trying to find out what had happened. And there were all kinds of rumors, as there often are in, in small towns in general, and, and obviously particularly at, the, at that time, if the family were very aware that it was a very tense um, and kind of contested situation and an area of the country. So I think they, they obviously had fears that the world had outset. Um, and then two weeks later, her body was found by young herd boys, um, uh, three boys of about 14 years old who were looking for their father's cattle in the bushes um, near it in Guavuma, which is about 100 kilometers away from Manguzi. And they found the remains of a body in a ditch near the gravel road ran home told their mother and their mother went to the police station and reported it and the the claire's purse was actually still found on her so they found her id book and so on and, and realized that it was it was her but this was also that two-week period also was was uh, right in the middle of that period was when south africa was in the middle of well when the new interim constitution was was signed and the various political parties that came to the table and eventually managed to hash out some kind of agreement for the most part. So it was a, it was at this very pivotal point, kind of right in the middle of this two week point from her abduction to when the body was found. Now your book po points out that her family, you know, believed strongly that her death was politically motivated. But the police found that Claire was actually well liked and had no local enemies. So there was this disconnect between the police and her family's beliefs of why she was killed? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there was a lot of obfuscation um, at, at the time in general. I mean, there was there were a lot of similar cases. Um, there was a lot of lawlessness in case at the time, a lot of police corruption, a lot of police complicity in, in other political killings, um, often working in tandem with the IFP to some degree. Um, so I think the family had a strong feeling and then the TRC investigators, when it was opened for, reopened for investigation after, after the TRC or during the TRC at a later stage, they all kind of came to the conclusion that there was deliberate obfuscation on the part of the police and also just a, to some degree, just to kind of disregard, they weren't really that interested, you know, as far as the police at the time were concerned, this Claire had kind of got herself into trouble and that was her own her own fault ultimately in, in their eyes to some degree. Yeah, there were a lot of red flags that were thrown up, you know, people that were constantly unavailable whenever the family tried to find out, you know, what was going on with the case or one of the leading investigators on the case had, had been in, um, charged for assault of Claire's ex-partner, um, who was also an ANC activist and trade unionist. Um, so that there were people that were implicated in other crimes um, whilst the investigation into Claire's disappearance and, and murder was was ongoing. Um, and I think you know there, there was a sense that some of the red herrings that were also being deliberately planted by the police to sort of throw people off the scent. Um, and I think also more broadly, there was just a huge and pervasive culture of fear. So a lot of people were afraid to to talk about what they might have seen or, or what might have actually been going on for for fear of repercussions um yeah tell us a bit about how you came across claire's story and about your interaction with her, her family in investigating her murder i first heard about it from my, my ex-wife's um, parents were good friends of claire's and they'd lived in manguzi uh during the same time that she was there 
Um, and at that stage, there were a very small handful of, for the most part, progressive whites living in Manguzi. So it was quite a close knit group, mostly either working at the hospital or in rural development, as Claire was. Um, and I was, I'm, I'm from the UK and I was new in South Africa at that time and um, relatively new. I'd only been in South Africa for a year or two and had never been to KZN and, and was very interested in this place that I didn't really know and this time in history that felt very important and, and the sort of life that my ex-wife's parents had lived there and, and through asking them about their time there and their stories I sort of began to hear about Claire and I just was very compelled by you know this the story of this woman who was there on her own as a single mother living in this very obviously dangerous scenario but with these very strong principles and and determination to kind of do what she felt was right even in the face of all of these different risks um, and and i just i found that very compelling and i wanted to kind of understand more so over time i just asked more and more about her and then i think simultaneously my ex-wife's mother in particular had also been kind of revisiting some of these periods in in her own life and, and also wondering what had happened to claire and if anyone would ever really know and then at some point kind of asked me if I would ever consider investigating it and writing about it and, and it was kind of a um, you know the kind of combination of, and coalescence of different factors kind of coming together at the same time some personal some contextual and then in subsequent years I was working on a lot of other stories in, in KwaZulu-Natal about more recent political violence and I just kind of felt that there was still this very clear link between the past that Claire had sort of got caught up in and then ultimately had, had claimed her life and, and what was still going on today to, you know, to the extent where it was sometimes even the very same weapons that were being used for political killings in the 90s were still being used in, in hits today. And that's how kind of tangible the link was sometimes. And yeah, and as I kind of delved deeper in this, into this, I kind of kept thinking more and more about Claire and also just feeling that her yeah her story had kind of been lost really because it had kind of got swept up in the kind of winds of change that were happening at the time um, and that she yeah deserved more recognition for, for the life that she led and, and and her principles and what she yeah what she believed in and what she tried to achieve and you visited the place where her body was found in that moment what was it like for you to be there knowing her story yeah, I mean, I went there uh, sort of in, in, in the middle of this whole period. I just started to get to know her children. Yeah, I, I went to the place where she, where the body was found sort of as I was just beginning to kind of get to know them and wondering about whether I was going to write a book or not and kind of having all these questions about my position and, and what I could do and should I be dredging up this past or not and what, what what impact might it have on the family and being in that place was a very strange feeling because there was no there was no visible sign you know the place completely changed it used to be a gravel road now it's a tar road there, there were almost no houses there previously now there are a lot of houses and it just kind of felt like yeah the, the history had literally been sort of built over and I had a very strong feeling in that moment that I really did want to pursue this and, and sort of see it through and see where it went um, and, and that was in 2018 which was you know I'd already it had already been sort of floating around and kind of coming in and out of my consciousness to varying degrees for about six years by that point and, and that was when I really kind of decided that I was going to, to do something with this and then here we are four years later so it's been an almost kind of 10-year process in a way. Lastly, there are so many anti-apartheid activists whose stories remain untold uh, and whose deaths remain a mystery to this day. Specifically for Claire, are you hoping that your book sparks the beginning of something as Claire's daughter Pulling had said in your book? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I talk about this in the book, but I was particularly with the family, but also for myself and my own expectations, I was very cautious um, about over-promising or saying, you know, this will definitely result or bring about some kind of justice um, because I think as with a lot of you know you mentioned there were obviously a lot of cases and a lot of activists that were killed and in many of those cases both 
in terms of the perpetrators and suspects and the witnesses and family members, a lot of people have died, a lot of people are elderly, a lot of people have moved on and kind of disappeared. And, you know, I, I was under no illusion from the beginning that, you know, the, the, the TRC investigators, very seasoned investigators, had failed to get to the bottom of this. Um, and they were doing it very close to the time. I'm coming in sort of 30 years later almost. You know, there, were, there was, it was always going to be a very difficult thing. And, and I never wanted to either set myself up to fail or kind of give some false hope to the family. But in terms of the book now being out in the world, I think, I think there is an important reckoning that's happening in South Africa more broadly with a lot of the crimes that happened during that period. You know, we've had cases like Ahmed Timol, um, Noctula Similani, and, and a lot of apartheid are cases that are kind of coming back into our, into the media and back into the national conversation, national discourse, and, and so on. And I think that Claire is an important part of that discourse about these sort of unfinished parts of our history and, and trying to build more of a foundation and justice um, and kind of in some ways carry on the work of, of the TRC but I think also just to find a place and more importantly in some ways I just think that you know to find a place for Claire as a person as an individual um, and I think that you know, she she was she was very young she was 34 when she was killed um, would have been very interesting to see where her life had gone had she lived but I think even in that short time there's a lot that people today can still learn from her story um, and from the way that she didn't just espouse certain principles, but really lived them and really tried to, to be completely true to them and how she lived her life. She spoke the language, she integrated into the community. She really went above and beyond what a lot of people were willing to do. I hope that people will draw inspiration from, from her story and that it will still speak to people in our kind of, you know, what is still a very contested um, context in South Africa today. But of course, if it happens to shake something loose in terms of what actually happened in, in the crime and so on, then that would be that would be a bonus. But I think in some ways, more importantly, it's just kind of, yeah, find, finding a space for Claire's story in the broader narrative of South Africa. That was journalist Christopher Clark discussing his book, Claire, The Killing of a Gentle Activist.